Who's your commander? Good luck. Equipped. Move to combat. Resolves. Now, before you attack Does me. anyone have an answer? Well played. Good game. Hello, Magic players. DJ here, and you're watching the Jumbo Commander YouTube channel. I made an awesome video about 100 budget cards that you can get that will fill out your collection full of EDH staples. Cards that you can put in tons of different decks that you can just have on hand and start building with. And so these cards are designed to be inexpensive, first off, but then also be able to fit into a bunch of different decks and really give you the ability to sort of brew with your own collection rather than always searching for that other card online. And also, it might just expose you to some really cool cards that are easy and cheap to pick up to maybe fill out your commander deck. Okay, so that video was great, and a lot of you liked it, and so I decided to go into a lot more detail. In fact, I went into so much detail, I think that there's like four hours of other videos out there on all of the colors, and this video today is gonna be on multicolored cards in this and artifacts in this. So I'm gonna jump right in and I'm gonna start talking about these cards individually with multi multicolored cards first. One thing to keep in mind is that this is gonna be sort of a longer video. And whenever I make longer videos, I like to make sure that it's uh, palatable if you don't wanna be looking at me or the card images. So I'm gonna try to read all the cards uh, and trying to give you sort of my off the cuff hot takes not really edited or refined opinion. So this is just kind of like a live conversation where you can try to get inside my head and then hopefully you can find some cards you like, but more importantly, see the approach I take to Commander and maybe it'll help you sort of use your own skills to evaluate cards and really make yourself a better brewer. All right. The first card I want to talk about is Zerta Druid. Zerta Druid is a red and a green for a 1-1 human druid that taps to add a green mana to your mana pool. Two mana mana dorks, they're not as good as one mana mana dorks because the acceleration is twice as slow. Now in Commander, we don't really care about that acceleration from, you know, one mana to three mana on turn two. Uh, we care a lot more of that bigger turn acceleration. That's why the four mana ramp two forests like um, uh, Sylvan. Oh my gosh, I'm already, I'm already starting off this video behind by not being sharp on the cards. <laughs> Anyways, a lot of the other ones like Explosive Vegetation are really solid cards in our format because uh, we want to get up to six mana, seven mana, eight mana. Um, so this isn't as explosive as one mana drops and not as explosive in a big way as sort of four mana or three mana ramp. So what does Zerta Druid bring to the table? Okay, well, whenever you tap Zerta Druid for mana, it deals one damage to each opponent. Ah, there we go. Okay, one damage seems really negligible but I have to tell you that incidental damage, it matters in this game. And one damage to each opponent means that you just tap this to ramp and suddenly you're lightning bolting something. Like one damage to each opponent is not a card, but maybe half a card? You know, you tap this a couple times and then suddenly you're doing real amounts of damage that's really threatening your opponents. And I have to say that when we're in a format where we don't desperately need one mana mana dorks, a two mana mana dork is not a huge sacrifice. In fact, many budget decks that I build will utilize the more flexible and more powerful two mana mana dorks uh, just because we don't have access to the Birds of Paradise or many of the other really powerful one mana drops. Although a bunch of them are pretty cheap. Okay, so Zerta Druid is a dork that also just ends up being able to burn out the opponent. And I feel like in red-green, that's exactly what you want. You have that aggressive uh, damage dealing of red and green oftentimes wants to get damage through, like force it through. And so making sure that you have little bits of ping damage uh, taking someone down is gonna be really, really valuable. 
Let's jump off to Judith, the Scourge Diva. One black red for a 2-2 legendary human shaman. Other creatures you control get plus one, plus zero. Whenever a non-token creature you control dies, Judith, the Scourge Diva, deals one damage to any target. Okay, Judith is coming in at just 33 cents. And Judith has a lot of good stuff going for her. Uh, just right off the bat, plus one, plus zero to all other creatures. This is uh, that Goblin Aura Flame that I mentioned before. That's a really desirable effect. I mean, to get the equivalent, you have to pay two mana for an enchantment, and then you automatically get a 2-2 two -two with Judith, and you get this whole other ability. Whenever a non-token creature you control dies, Judith deals one damage to any target. That's like kind of a blood artist effect where you can sort of point the damage where you want to. Blood Artist is obviously different. Cards like Mayhem Devil are obviously different uh, because Blood Artist drains. You can't aim it at creatures. Uh, but Blood Artist is uh, $4, you know? And so some of these aristocrats effects, uh, these pinging effects like Judith, uh, can be pretty expensive. One thing that I also really like is that this damage can be pointed anywhere. That means if they have a tiny creature that's dumb and you want to take out, well, you can point Judith at it. Um, you can even combo this up and give Judith Death Touch, and then suddenly you're just machine gunning down your opponent's creatures. Uh, Judith is pretty strong, and I honestly think that you don't have to build this crazy Corvold sacrifice deck with all the aristocrats and the sacrifice outlets and the, and the fodder of creatures that honestly, you could just play Judith. She anthems your dudes, you swing in, you do a bunch of damage, and then when they block, you point that damage to kill off some creatures and deal damage to your opponent. You know, it just makes combat really difficult. So I really feel like Judith, even though everyone fixates on making it really like run extremely well, doesn't need to do that. They could just slam this in a Rakdos deck and be really happy with how she performs. All right. Moving on to the next one, we have, by the way, we already did uh, Brutal Horde Chief. Very nice. Uh, it's I, It said a lot of stuff similar to Judith because that plus one plus zero, oh, Brutal Horde Chief automatically drains when people attack. It's just great. Okay, moving on, we have another sort of aggressive creature with Dusk Mantle Seer. You know, Demir doesn't really have very many aggressive uh, based uh, cards. Um, you know, I say that, but when we think about Demir, we might think about milling someone out or, you know, zombies or something like that. In fact, if I go over to EDH rec and I go over to the Demir slot, I wonder what the most popular commanders are. Ooh, never mind. We have a really aggressive one with Yuriko. Then we have Value with Scarab God, Phoenix is Mill, Una is Combo Fairies, Lazav is definitely Graveyard Shenanigans, Zombies, okay, gr more Graveyard Shenanigans with Lazav. Uh, Atrada's a little bit tricky and a fun win condition. And then we have another sort of combat-based one with Sig River Cutthroat. This is the one I was kind of thinking about, Sig River Cutthroat over here. Uh, Dusk Mantle Seer is a four mana, four, four, flyer, beats down hard, but more importantly, at the beginning of your upkeep, each player reveals the top card of their library, loses life to that card's converted mana cost, then puts it into their hand. Which means I love Dusk Mantle Seer as an aggressive attacker. You attack in for four, bam, bam, but then everyone is taking more damage off the top of their library. You know, having your own personal Dark Confidant uh, is a really, really good effect. I mean, I know that Dark Confidant is not the same, and this is by no means a $45 card. Dusk Mantle Seer definitely uh, gives this damage to everyone. So you have to wonder like, okay, if I'm just giving everyone a draw, you know, where's the advantage? I really think the advantage comes with the damage. If you can kill your opponents before they can use the cards you give them, then that's totally fine. In fact, do you know what it has me thinking of? is, oh, I typed in Goblin again. I typed in the Goblin again, and there's 197 results. Is Goblin Guide. Goblin Guide, not a commander card, 
But it's, Dust Mantle Seer has the same premise, where it's like, okay, I know I'm gonna have you drawing a card every so often. Goblin Guide, by the way, is a one red mana, two, two with haste. Whenever Goblin Guide attacks, defending player reveals the top card of their library. If it's a land card, that player puts it into their hand. Goblin Guide says, look, I know I'm gonna be drawing you cards every so often. That's totally cool because my game plan is smashing you so hard, it doesn't matter if I draw you three cards over the course of the game, you're gonna die with cards in your hand. Same thing with Dusk Mantle Seer. You're prioritizing the damage over the card advantage. And you're also hoping that your curve is low enough that number one, you can deploy your creatures and your cards faster than your opponents can. So you are taking advantage of the card draw, whereas they are not. And also you, the damage dealt to you is minimized because your cards are of a lower curve versus them. Now, I am realizing now that part of my mantra of making sure that these cards are really able to fit in any deck means that Dusk Mantle Seer uh, is feeling a little bit narrow. You know what I mean? You go over here and look at the top Demir Commanders and you're like, well, where does Dusk Mantle Seer fit in? Down here with Sig River Cutthroat? You know, not with any of the other ones? No, I honestly think that Dusk Mantle Seer can be really good card advantage even if it is sort of slotted into a deck that isn't particularly taking advantage of it. I know it feels a little bit group huggy, but I think that any effect where you're drawing cards can be really strong in these colors. And when you think about the alternatives that you have, I mean, Dust Mental Seer is really solid for the price point. Speaking of drawing cards on a creature, Storev, Drevakar, Dev Karin Lich. It's a mouthful. One black, black, green for a legendary creature, zombie, elf, wizard. It's a 5 4 with trample. Whenever, whenever Storev deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, return to your hand target creature or planeswalker card in your graveyard that wasn't put there this combat. So this 26 cent card is basically a permanent tutor, a creature planeswalker tutor when it connects with someone. And the body is great. It's a four mana five, four trampler. That's solid. Uh, so really what it kind of feels like is it's a four mana five, four when it hits draw card, right? I mean, I'm hoping that in Golgari, you're going to have something in your graveyard. So I'm hoping that this is just a really solid card draw dude. And Actually, that has me thinking of another card, which is Neheb Dreadhorde Champion. This is a completely different card, but two red red, a four CMC, five four trample. When it hits someone, there's some hoops, obviously, but you draw some cards. By the way, this is an amazing card. Maybe just missed the list coming in at 52 cents. Anyone that's excited about a 33 cent card has to be okay with a 52 cent card. So pick up Neheb as well. Uh, the, both of these cards, Neheb and Storev, uh, people don't like them because you need to connect in order to get the value. And that's true. That is 100% a downside. Creatures are vulnerable in our format. Sometimes it's difficult to get damage through. And so there, these are some hoops, but all you have to do is hit with Storev once. You hit with Storev once and suddenly that card is worth it. Do you know what I mean? Like you've dealt damage, you've made them answer it, you've gotten a creature back, you only have to connect once. It doesn't have to be this amazing engine that you use every single turn. And there's always the possibility that it becomes that, that it is an engine that just keeps returning creatures to your hand over and over again. I feel like there's a good Jund deck just literally in the cards that I'm looking at. Like just imagine like Zerta Druid and Isareth and Judith and Loyal Subordinate and Plague Crafter. Oh my gosh, I'm just putting this deck together in Storev and oh, let's make it, let's make a deck guys. Let's come, come on, come on everyone. Let's come together and make a deck together. Cloud Blazer, 18 cents. Cloud Blazer is three white blue for a two, two human scout with flying. And when Cloud Blazer enters the battlefield, you gain two life and draw two cards. This is value. It's a three for one. A two, two flyer is a worthwhile body. Uh, this is, similar to Moldrifter. 
Mole Drifter is a solid one, which has two L's in it. Mole Drifter is risen over a dollar, which makes me super duper sad. But Mole Drifter is another solid little, little dude, little elemental, little flying fish. It's five mana, two, two flyer, enters the battlefield, draws two cards. Mole Drifter also has some flexibility of being able to evoke it for two and a blue, basically turns it into a divination. And so Mold Drifter is a solid card that is honestly a staple in our format. So Cloud Blazer, right over here. Yeah, you got to pay some white mana. You don't have that divination built in, but you gain two life. That's a good trade-off. I'll take it. This card is great for blinking, great for getting in chip damage. But honestly, the ability to just replace itself and dig deeper is super duper solid. All right. This is amazing the this 14 cent card garna the blood flame three black red for a legendary human warrior three three garna has flash and when garna enters the battlefield return to your hand all creature cards in your graveyard that were put there from the anywhere this turn from anywhere this turn other creatures you control have haste there's so much text on this card. Let's break it down one at a time. Okay, so Flash. Flash is powerful. Flash means that you can get this in at any point in time. Uh, other creatures you control have haste. That's really solid too, especially with Flash. So you can flash this in at the end of someone else's turn and suddenly every creature you deploy on your turn is gonna be a real threat, able to instantly attack. So as a haste anthem type thing, this is pretty solid. I mean, there's a lot of different things that give haste and it's not a particularly expensive uh, ability. Fervor is the just solid red one. It's just like, yep, this is the red enchantment. Your creatures have haste. Over a dollar and not exciting, by the way. Hammer of Perforos is the other one. And I actually think this is less than a dollar. No, it's 225. Unbelievable. Everything has haste, and then you sacrifice a land and then you can make it into a 3-3. Three, three. By the way, I don't even like this. I think it's not good to sacrifice lands to make them 3-3s. Three, Too often you feel the need to, to do that effect, and it's just not great. What else gives haste? I mean, if we're talking about the other Praetor, let's do creature type Praetor because I forget exactly what it is. It's the red Praetor. Creature type Praetor, P-R-A. There we go. Again, Scryfall saving me when I can't remember the name Urbrask. Urbrask, five mana. Creature you control have haste. Great, it's just a haste enabler. Five mana, haste enabler, great. Don't we have this over here? Now I know Urbrask really does slow down your opponents by having them enter the battlefield tap. That's a really, really good effect. But for $5, for close to six bucks, I don't know if it's worth it for six bucks. This is still five mana. And Garna suddenly has flash, okay? And it also, I haven't even gotten to the best part. The best part is that Garna basically draws cards when she enters the battlefield. When she enters the battlefield, return to your hand all creature cards in your graveyard that were put there from anywhere this turn. Uh, do your opponent's board wipe? Garna, get all my creatures back. Do they mill you? Garna, get them all back. Do they wheel a fortune? Garna, get them all back. And then when it becomes my turn, I play them again and they immediately have haste. This is great. This is really solid board wipe protection. It's not the best board wipe protection because you know, you're not really redeploying. There is a mana cost uh, when you're holding up five mana. There's a mana cost when you have to redeploy your whole board, but this is saving that card loss. Yeah, rebuilding is slower, but it really, really is uh, just a solid, solid card. I mean, I I don't know how much I can get across how powerful Garnet is for the price of 14 cents. She's... She's really good and she's gonna be solid in a lot of your decks. I mean, people want to go go crazy. They wanna like discard stuff and they wanna discard their hand and get a bunch of cards back. But honestly, if you're just doing like a thrill of possibility, you thrill of possibility and Garna the creature back, fine. That's great. Garna becomes a 3-3 that grants everything haste that drew you a card. That's amazing. 
flashy 3-3 three, three, haste everything draws you a card. G gross. Gross. Okay, we're still building this Jun deck together. This is Sekuar Deathkeeper. Two black, red, green. This is the only other multicolored card, like three color card uh, on the list. And I really felt like it was super good for the price of 28 cents. 28 cents, man. I mean, I think that this card is so good and the price is so low. Okay, this is a 4-3 Orc Shaman and whenever another non-token creature you control dies, create a 3-1 black and red graveborn creature token with haste. So your creatures die, and then suddenly they don't actually die. Graveborns, three ones with haste, come back again. Um, so what people try to do is they try to build this deck as a big deck full of sacrifice outlets, and that's fun. That is a fun deck to build. We go down here and it looks like it's number eight on the list of Jund Planeswalkers. Um, but let's look at Anax right here. Um, because if you like the feel of Anax, then you are going to love the feel of Sekuar. Whenever Anax or another non-token creature you control dies, create a 1-1 one, one red satyr creature token with this creature can't block. With this creature can't block. If the creature had power 4 or greater, create two of those tokens instead. Uh, if you also like, you know, Pawn of Ulamog or Sifter of Skulls, this really solid effect of when things die, they don't really die. You get other dudes, or you get treasure, or you get to draw cards, or you just get tons of advantage. You know, you get to Judith people, you get to Zulaport people, and all sorts of great stuff. I mean, this deck is so, so fun. Why do I have 80 cards in a clipboard? I don't know what deck that is, but well, it's gonna be awesome. So, Seku, let's just add Sekuar to the deck. Why not? So Sekuar is just a really great way to have this second level of redundancy and really give you some protection from, from board wipes, protection, because these creatures, by the way, they don't go away. Like someone could board wipe you and then you just create a, another army of three ones and say, deal with that. Not to mention what happens when you have cards with sacrifice outlets on them like Secure Tribe Elder, or Skull Clamp, where you can Skull Clamp these three ones. Uh, yeah, it's great. It's so much fun. And it's really great to send your own creatures to the graveyard. You know, you Shriek Moss in the graveyard, Priest of Forgotten Gods. You know, oh my gosh, this is a great one. Emrakul's Evangel, it's really cheap too. Emrakul's Evangel is two and a green for a three, two human horror. You can tap and sacrifice Evangel and any number of other non-Eldrazi creatures to put a 3-2 colorless Eldrazi horror creature token onto the battlefield for each creature sacrifice this way. I love this. You just sacrifice your board and then you have a bunch of 3-2s on the battlefield. It's, uh, it's kind of a fun big sacrifice outlet. And just imagine if when you do that, you also create 3-1 hasty uh, <laughs> graveborn creatures. Oh my gosh. Here's the thing, here's what it comes down to. Uh, I love that this goes into Jund, that basically your creatures, they don't really die, they come back. I like that you can combo with it. I like that, you know, it's a, it's a really redundant effect, but uh, in the end, I just wanna smash people. I just wanna play Sekuar and turn all of them into four zeros, and then when I sack my you know, Zertod Druid or something like that. Judith pings them and I got a three one. I mean, that's the redundancy that makes for some fun commander. All right, let's move on to our, my only multicolored enchantment and that is Theater of Horrors. At 30 cents, Theater of Horrors is one black red for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your library. During your turn, if an opponent lost life this turn, you may play cards exile with Theater of Horrors. Three and a red, Theater of Horrors deals one damage to target opponent or Planeswalker. So what is this? It's just card draw. One black red, draw a card. Honestly, yes, there's a hoop. But honestly, are you not gonna be able to deal damage, a single damage to a single opponent? And if you really need access to those cards, you can pay three and a red and get access to them. You know, Theater of Horrors coming in at 30 cents is, is kind of crazy because red 
and even black can have a hard time getting access to some of these cards. Like if I look at uh, some of these abilities, like, um, actually I'm gonna try to find all of them. Exile card red. Maybe this might work. I don't know. How many of them? 68. So that's a few. Um, but if we're looking at this effect, honestly, it's on Chandra. Way expensive. 20 bucks. Oh my gosh. And Chandra's vulnerable. Okay. Uh, we look at this effect happening over and over again. It's going to be on... Let's see here. I'm going to find all of them because there's a few of them I want to point out. Outpost Siege. Outpost Siege I love. Outpost Siege you should buy. 57 cents. This is your other one that doesn't quite make the super budget list, but it belongs on the list for sure. Outpost Siege. The downside is that at the beginning of your upkeep, you exile the top card of your library until end of turn you may play that card. Let's compare that to Theater of Horrors. Uh, yeah, it's in black, so it's a little bit less flexible, but it's three mana, and then basically you have more flexibility for when you can use those cards because anytime you deal damage, you have access to all of those cards. Outpost Siege has a hidden mode that you should definitely pay attention to, which is Dragons. Uh, whenever a creature you control leaves the battlefield, Outpost Siege deals one damage to any target. Any target. This is exactly like Judith, except for it's anything leaves the battlefield. Judith right here. Okay. Any, whenever a creature you control leaves the battlefield, this only triggers off of tokens. So literally all those tokens leave, those Graveborns you have, anything, and suddenly you're just pointing damage. Pew, 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 pew. And so Outpost Siege in the early game can get you ahead in cards, and in the late game can start pinging things to death and pointing the damage almost like Judith. It's amazing. Okay, so I've mentioned that Outpost Siege is good. That wasn't my, like, that wasn't the goal of this whole thing. But my goal is to explain how good, good Theater of Horrors is. But you can see that Outpost Siege is really, really solid and much, much more expensive. Uh, but they really serve equal roles. Let's find one more. It's Vance's Blasting Cannons, I think I want to show you. Let's see here. Where's Vance? There we go. Vance's Blasting Cannon. One more mana. Still, you have this limitation at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your library. Okay. If it's a non land card, you can cast it this turn. And then it has this ability to transform. Okay. And do. I don't know, like, whatever. <laughs> Something silly, okay? Uh, Theater of Horrors even lets you play those cards, so it lets you play lands. Bl Vance's Blasting Station, do Blasting Station doesn't even let you do that, and it's 28 cents. It's the same price as this one. Sorry, I was thinking for a second. It's the same price of Theater of Horrors, but why on earth would you do that? Theater of Horrors also compares really strongly to Phyrexian Arena. It just makes sense. This card is card draw. It's right next to Underworld Connections, by the way. Look at them. They're little best buds right there, okay? If you think that Phyrexian Arena is the only recurring card advantage that you need in black, and you feel forced to spend $12, I don't remember the price, on it, then don't. You have options. You totally do. Let's move on to my favorite charm. Is it my favorite charm? Yes. Uh, Rakdos Charm is really good, too. This is pretty much my favorite charm, though. Golgari Charm. Black and agreed for an instant. Choose one. All creatures get minus one, minus one until end of turn. Destroy target enchantment. Regenerate each creature you control. This is awesome. This is the regenerate clause that we really need. And this is coming in at 29 cents. We need protection. There are board wipes in this format. You're, you need to block sometimes. <laughs> you need to attack. Your creatures die. This could be a two for one, a seven for one. It could save your whole board. It can save your game. Mass regeneration is great. In fact, I there's another mass regeneration effect in green and it's about a dollar uh, because you really do need this stuff and some of these cards are getting expensive. Not necessarily in, Eldra in uh, Golgari, but excuse me. Um, when you think about heroic intervention, Research heroic. Heroic intervention is gonna be expensive. Oh, it's up to $16, $17 now. Gross. Okay. Protection. Teferi's protection. Oh my gosh, 17. Okay. Teferi's protection. This is gonna be gross too. 
It's $42. Nope. Nope. Let's find other ways to protect our creatures. You know what I mean? Uh, there's a good card in green that's only a dollar, but it's still a dollar. Uh, and it's not even that great. Let's go green. Let's go regen each. Regenerate each. Ten cards. Let's find it. Yeah, there's no way I'm going to remember. There it is. Wrap in Vigor. Uh, 87 cents. Okay, so this is just barely on the fringe of being budget, but it just says regenerate each creature you control. 87 cents for that effect. Golgari Charm does that, takes out an enchantment, and hits all of your opponent's plants from, uh, <laughs> hits all of their sapperlings that they have from, uh, let's see, all these things that it hits. It hits all of their birds from Migratory Route. It hits all of their sapperlings from Verdant Force. Uh, it hits all of their little uh, uh, little guys. It hits all their squirrels because you take out Deep Forest Hermit because it gives it minus one, minus one. And then all your squirrels that were two twos are now minus one, minus ones. Takes out your, your whatevers, your flying artifact things. It takes out your goblins. Oh my gosh. Turns out Golgari Charm's other mode is just secretly good. Uh, but honestly, there's a lot of different things in Golgari Charm that really make a big difference to the game uh, with that minus one, minus one. Okay, so the minus one, minus one can have a big impact on go wide decks. Um, what's the what's the thing that does landfall? Um, again, it might not be entirely smart today, but you know what? You don't need to be smart when you have the internet and you have Scryfall helping you out. It's a creature. It has landfall and it grows plants. It's Avenger of Zendikar. Before I even pulled it up, it's Avenger of Zendikar. But honestly, this could be a big problem, okay? Like your deck might not be able to handle this, but they play Avenger of Zendikar, they play a land, and with that uh, trigger on the stack, you go Gari Charm their plants away, and suddenly they've spent seven mana on a 5-5. Five five. Five fives are nothing. It's the plant growing effect that really takes it out. So Golgari Charm is great at answering tokens. And I went through the list of cards in this budget list. We put out one ones all the time. Okay, enchantments are also really strong. There are crazy big enchantments. We are right now in the midst of Theros Beyond Death. There are so many crazy enchantments. Don't you want to kill them? Don't you want to kill uh, a Nyxborn. Not a Nyxborn Colossus. Oh no! I thought it was uh, I thought it was like a Nyxborn Ancient or something like that. Oh my gosh, I really want you to be able to kill. There we go. Oh, it is a Nyx Bloom Ancient. Don't you want to be able to go Gari Charm a Nyx Bloom Ancient? Don't you want to? Your friend that dropped 12 bucks on this dorky card that gives them all the man in the world. And they spend seven mana to get on the battlefield and they're giddy with the fact that they're gonna untap and you take your Golgari charm and you're like, yeah, I was gonna regenerate my creatures, but I'm just gonna disenchant that thing. Oh my gosh, the feelings. I would love to destroy that target enchantment so much. Oh, I love it. Okay, flexible, defensive. Uh, in so many different ways. It's so good. That's exactly what you want out of your defensive cards, is for them to be flexible to adapt to any situation. Golgari Charm. Run it. It's amazing. You know what? The reason why I do this is to be able to talk about other stuff. I want to talk about Rakdos Charm. I wonder if this... The reason why I didn't include this is because it's above... Yeah, okay. The reason why I didn't include this is because the bottom one was 58 cents, but honestly, Rakdos Charm is another card that I really, really like. Okay, so it really has similar effects. Exile all cards from target player's graveyard. Against some decks, this is backbreaking. This is amazing. So many different commander decks use the graveyard. Being able to answer the graveyard is gonna be really, really important. And then if we look at some of the most uh, other common ways of doing it, like Bajukabog, Bajukabog is not expensive, but it's also not cheap. Uh, $1.70 for Bajukabog. And that's like one of the more common ways to answer the graveyard. And so if you need a way to answer the graveyard, this could be one of them. Uh, I also like Relic. 
as a good way of answering the graveyard. It was reprinted. Are there, how many relics are there? Only 16. It was reprinted at Uncommon. So again, over a dollar, but pretty cheap way of answering the graveyard. And it's nice because you can draw a card. Okay, but ways to answer the graveyard are important. So Rakdos Charm can answer it at instant speed in a sneaky way. Great way to blow out your opponent. Destroy target artifact, useful, so useful. There are crazy artifacts all over the place. You need to destroy them from time to time. Perfect card. But the greatest mode, the hidden mode, the sometimes I just win the game mode is each creature deals one damage to its controller. You ever have that friend that just throws too much on the battlefield, goes too wide, flies too close to the sun, makes too many soldiers? Rakdos Charm is just like, boom, two mana, just do a ton of damage all across the table. It's this crazy burn spell that has the potential to punish people that go ultimate, to punish people that have these combos that create a bajillion different creatures that can sometimes just two mana deal 10, you know, now you're in danger of dying to the board. Oh, so good, so good. All right, sorry for that tangent, but that's that's why I'm making this video, is to go on tangents on weird things like Rakdos Charm and other stuff. Let's talk about Death Sprout. One, black, black, green for an instant, destroy target creatures, search your library for basic land and put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library for 19 cents. Uh, removal spell, removal and ramp, okay? I know four mana is tough, you know, when you can look at five mana, um, we go to Wind Grace. I honestly think that Wind Grace's Judgment is a very solid five mana Golgari spell. And I thought it would be more expensive. It's only $2.40. But this literally destroys three things. Three things for one additional mana. This destroys one thing. Okay, but one thing I love about Death Sprout is that it still keeps some of the parity. Whenever you have removal spells, you really do want them to be two for ones. And honestly, the ramp on Death Sprout really does fit into the, the theme of, of Commander. Uh, Death Sprout is kind of like kill something, draw a card. That's good. That's very good. You would play that card. And so Death Sprout, I know it's not draw a card, but getting a land on the battlefield is still really good. It plays into the strong uh, strong um, categories of commander. Wind Grace's Judgment is really good too because you're getting rid of three things. It's a three for one. You don't really lose uh, tempo against the rest of the table. And I think the fact that Death Sprout puts you down a card but also up a land means that you're really not losing that much tempo at the table. I wonder if there's a destroy... What if there's a destroy target and draw effect? I'm pretty sure that there is. I just don't know exactly what it is. Um, don't you love that? I'm like, I'm pretty sure I know what it is. But then again, I don't know what it is. Oh my gosh, maybe there really isn't just a kill something draw card. That's crazy. Destroy a creature you draw X cards and lose FX worth is the number of counters on that creature. That's not, that's not good. I mean, I like this Slay, destroy target green creature, it can't be regenerated, draw a card. Maybe we should all be playing Slay in our decks. This has got to be budget right here. Six cents for Slay? Dude, metagame, metagame, guys. Metagame your your playgroup. Is everyone running around with Oracle of Moldias and uh, crazy stuff? Just run Slay. Just run Slay. And then suddenly you are totally ahead of the game. Slice and Twain, by the way, very, very good. Four cents, four cents. You immediately get to, you get to kill something and then replace the card. Like so good. There's a reason why Cryptic Command, a uh, counter draw, is so good because you don't end up behind on tempo. Here it is. Annihilate. Destroy target non bat creature. Can't be regenerated. Draw a card. Five. I don't know. Five is rough. Destroy target white creature now. Destroy X target non bat creatures. Draw X cards. All right, Dregs of Sorrow. This is gonna be your budget. 14 cents, we did it. Okay, destroy X target non by creatures, draw X cards. So for six mana, you get to kill one thing and draw a card. Seven mana, 
Seven mana, you get to kill what two things and draw two cards. I mean, yeah, that's pretty good. I don't know, it just doesn't seem to be as efficient as Death Sprout. I mean, I'm I'm a big fan. I like it. Okay. Uh, but the principles essentially are the same of like don't don't end up down a card to answer your opponent. Instead, end up sort of neutral or ahead, you know. Okay. Let's go on to Whispering Madness. Two blue black for sorcery. Each player discards their hand, then draws cards equal to the greatest number of cards discarded this way. Cypher. We'll talk about Cypher in a little bit, but this is Windfall. Windfall is great. I love that they reprinted Windfall, by the way, in um, Iconic Masters as uh, Uncommon. This is great, but still, an uncommon printing, three commander printings, and it's 270. You know, it's closing in on $3. But sometimes you just want more than one effect of this. Whispering Madness is only an additional black for this effect, but also, oh my gosh, did it already go up with 43 cents? I could have sworn it was in the 30 cent range. Okay, I got distracted. Um, <coughs> but also, it has this cipher. So if you want this effect, you can cipher this on spell onto a creature, and whenever it deals combat damage, you get to cast this card again. It's so fun. You just keep windfalling over and over and over again. Ah, uh, yeah, that's great. I mean, it, the cipher mechanic is so weird. <laughs> it's so weird. Encode this spell onto a creature and then you get to recast it. Um, it's great. And so if you cast this once, Windfall is, is a good card. Okay. Slightly more expensive windfall is like, eh, it's okay. Okay. If you cipher this onto a creature, then it makes that creature much more relevant. And so your opponents might, I don't know, um, misinterpret how important that creature is. And then maybe you'll get up on card advantage again. Okay. That's a tiny bit of a map. But if you ever get to cast this twice, you cipher it under creature, you get in for damage, you cast it again when you need to, the value is insane. Just imagine four mana double windfall. It's so good. It's so good. Windfall is just a really solid card in our format. And so Whispering Madness, I'm surprised it's not more. All right. Migratory Route is a is a testament to how great um, multi-flexible cards can be. So hitting your land drops in Commander is one of the most important things you can do. Mana is key. And if you ever don't hit your land drop, you are so far behind. Like you might feel far behind, but you're actually further behind than you think. So this card is 17 cents. And what does it do? It throws some birds on the battlefield, whatever. Five mana, create four birds. Eh. You know, that's actually a pretty good effect. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty aggressively costed too. So I would like to have some birds. You know, they can block, they can attack, they do wealth anthems, they hold equipment really well. It's a pretty okay card. But what's amazing is that you can just chuck this and search up a basic. Oh, oh my gosh, the fixing. It's the fixing on this card. That basic land cycling is so good. Uh, I, I love basic land cycling. Nope, 310 cards. Basic land cycling. There we go. Uh, I love the basic land cycling cards and there are not very many of them. If you look up here, there are 15 of them and some of them kind of suck. Uh, I like Ancient Excavation a lot. It came up to over a dollar. This is basically an effect where you can filter your hand. Uh, two blue black for an instant, draw cards equal to the number of cards in your hand, then discard a card for each card drawn this way. So you get to really sculpt your hand. If you have five cards, you get to draw five more and then discard five, you know? And so selecting exactly what you want to keep afterwards. Uh, basic land cycling, that just makes this card so much better. I really like Ancient Excavation. It's a shame that it's so expensive. Uh, Absorb This, Fiery Fall, Gleam of Resistance, uh, Traumatic Visions, those are all not good. They're just not. I already talked about Crows and Tusker and how great that is. Grave Upheaval is gonna be the other, wow, it's still almost a dollar. 
I think that this one is a little bit clunky. Six mana put target creature from a graveyard on the battlefield under your control. It gains haste. That's pretty good, you know, like, but that's six mana. Uh, I, we can see this effect for five mana or four mana really well. Remember, this is just one of those effects where you can reanimate something. And we've seen it be really underwhelming at five mana. If you watch my video in black, I talk about, um, hang on, let's go back in time. I talk about, uh, why uh, the the Eldest Reborn is really solid and that at five mana, there's a lot of different reanimation effects, but the Eldest Reborn does extra. So you're like, okay, I'm, I'm willing I'm willing to accept it. Uh, but there's a lot at five that you don't care about. Four is like, okay, three is getting really powerful. Two is amazing. And one is like, oh, let's just reanimate. Grave Upheaval also gives haste. I guess that's where that red comes in. And so maybe you could be like, all right, you know, Maybe this can hang with the other five mana reanimate effects, but this basic land cycling really makes it flexible so that you can have this card be what you want. Uh, this is probably the most expensive one, uh, Sylvan Reclamation. It's great, exile two things. So you basically get your two for one and you get your flexibility, super solid. I love Treacherous Train. I'm so sad it went above 50 cents. Just kidding, it's right at 50 cents. This is eight mana, deals damage to each opponent equal to the number of lands that player controls. Great, punish those people that are putting so many lands on the battlefield. Pay eight, deal, I don't even know. I see people with just their whole deck on the battlefield and it's just lands everywhere. I just wanna be able to pay eight and literally deal like 30 across three players. So amazing. Basic land cycling means that this could basically be a land. It's so good. Fixes you. Just make sure you hit those land drops. It's amazing. Okay, I talked about basic land cycling and how that flexibility is so important, how hitting your land drops is so important. Speaking of which, we got Urban Evolution. This is Divination and Explore put together into one card. I like Divination, I like Explore, but Urban Evolution seems to be great because it really turns that two for one into a three for one. Draw three cards, you may play an additional land this turn. It's great when you're in a slower format where you don't need to hit things on two, you don't need to hit things on three, you can just draw and ramp on turn five. And that's fine, that's totally fine. Uh, Urban Evolution is amazing, the art is great, the price at 12 cents, can't go wrong. And the final multicolored card is Find Finality. Find is Golgari Golgari. Return two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. Um, double regrowth for creatures? For just two? Yeah. Great. That's already that is already great. That's already a card. I'm done. Don't need to don't need to explain anything else. This is worth 23 cents. We're amazing. Okay, it also has finality. Four black green. You may put two plus one plus one counters on a creature you control, then all creatures get minus four, minus four until end of turn. See, people want both sides of this to do something impactful, and finality might miss. It really does. It does not hit every important creature in Commander. There are tons of different misses for finality. And so people are like, I don't know, it's not a true board wipe, I don't want it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Sometimes, you will find two creatures back, it's a two for one. And sometimes you will play finality and take out three or four creatures uh, that you want gone anyways, and you got a four for one. This is guaranteed to get you card advantage. I can't see how it doesn't. It's very, very good. And um, people are too focused on it not serving this finality. So instead you have to be like, look, this is, this is my recursion. This is my card advantage spell. And if I happen to be able to have it be a flexible board wipe when I need it, great! You know, don't have it be your only board wipe if you need board wipes in your deck, but, you know, but use it as a card advantage engine. It's amazing. All right, that has been the multicolored section. I'm gonna ramp right back up to the top and start talking about artifacts, and then I'm gonna tell all of you how amazing you are and uh, and how I wanna thank you for sticking with me with this video. I'm gonna take all right, everyone, I'm back from my little break. I got some spicy water and mm, 
Oh yeah, I'm ready to talk about some artifacts. Let's start with Crashing Drawbridge. Two mana for a 0-4 artifact creature wall with defender. Tap creatures, creatures you control gain haste until end of turn. <clears throat> now we've already talked about haste. We've seen it on Garna. We've I've talked about it on a lot of different red cards. But this is colorless. Like colorless means a lot. It means flexibility across many different decks. And Crashing Drawbridge can fit into green decks and blue decks and white decks and uh, the decks that aren't red. <laughs> um, haste is very, very good. And it's better than you think. Uh, what it does is it really accelerates your ability to deploy your stuff. It moves you more than one turn ahead because so often people need to play at sorcery speed. They need a turn to deal with your stuff. And if it has haste, then you're the one dealing with your opponents. Uh, in green, you got Concordant Crossroads, giving things haste, uh, $16. And it's ugly. It's white bordered chronicles. Ugh. $85 if you want a black bordered wow. $85 if you want a black border version. Just kidding. $61 moderately played. In colorless, we have a Chroma's Memorial. Great. This gives haste, right? Seven mana gives a lot more than haste, except for it's $22. I mean, thanks, but no. Like, this is really expensive to deploy. And if you just want haste, it's expensive on your budget too. Uh, in black, you have Mogus's Marauder. This is budget. And in fact, if you've got a black deck and you, you need to sort of have some haste, Mogus's Marauder could be a good pickup. Uh, two and a black for a 2-2 two -two creature human berserker. When Mogus's Marauder enters the battlefield, up to X target creatures each gain Intimidate and haste until end of turn where X is your devotion to black. Now, Intimidate is great because it's going to get the damage through, and Haste could be really good, uh, even though this might be only a one-off effect. Uh, I like Mogus's Marauder a lot, and really, it, it kind of works with Black, too. Like, if you're going to play this, then, you know, you might have a lot more Black Pips to be able to uh, have a lot of creatures get through uh, for damage. Uh, but again, Narrow, you know? Not two mana tap, go. <laughs> and then finally, something else that's super duper narrow, Audric. If something has haste, it could literally give everything haste. It's the generic uh, just anthem effect. Not that expensive for 152, but it's a two card combo to give haste. I don't want a two card combo to give haste. I literally want two mana tap, give everything haste. At eight cents sense man all right um your decks could want this really badly and it's a really powerful effect for two mana let's move on to the next artifact creature in treasure keeper four mana three three artifact creature construct when Cre treasure keeper dies reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a non-land card with converted mana cost three or less you may cast that card without paying its mana cost put all the reveal cards not cast this way on the bottom of your library in a random order this is a 10 cent card and it is a weird black backwards bloodbraid elf bloodbraid elf is great. It basically, you cast it, it's got haste, it's 3-2, and it cascades. It cascades into another card. Now, Bloodbraid Elf is much more aggressive. By the way, it's a dollar fifty, a dollar, a little over a dollar. Bloodbraid Elf is a lot more aggressive. It has haste, and it deploys that other card on ETB, on cast, because it's cascade. Treasure Keeper sort of replaces itself as it dies. But one thing to keep in mind is that this is four generic mana versus five worth is four in two different colors this is an artifact you can use this in anything and uh it also is a sort of dies trigger and so any sort of deck where you're going to be sacrificing things uh bringing things back from the graveyard really churning through your deck um, means the treasure keeper could give you a lot of really strong advantage it's it's a little bit harder to have cascade work and so Treasure Keeper is in good company if you're comparing it to Blood Bright Elf, and it fits in a ton of different decks. All right, let's go on to 
The next big creature is Meteor Golem. Meteor Golem is 7 mana for a 3-3 artifact creature golem. When it enters the battlefield, destroy target non-land permanent and opponent controls. This is 10 cents. Okay. So, 7 mana, 3-3, three, three, destroy a thing. Uh, the only reason why you really want this is if you need the flexibility. Because if you're in white, I mean, what are you going to destroy? You can kill everything already. But maybe you're in mono black and you need to answer an enchantment once in a while. Meteor Golem. Maybe you're in colorless and you need to answer some Meteor Golem. Maybe you are in green and mana's not an issue, but you just literally need to kill your opponent's commander. And you don't have fight mechanics to do it, so Meteor Golem. Okay, It's a really solid go-to answer that can fit in a bunch of different decks. It's particularly good if you can double up the trigger. Um, reminds me of Spine of Saw. This is a 60 cent card. Uh, enters the battlefield, destroy target permanent. Bam. It's put in the graveyard. You get it back to your hand. Um, the one thing that makes me sad about Meteor Golem in our format is that it's a non-land permanent. Man, I really wish this could take out a Gaius Cradle. I mean, literally, it's a meteor slamming into the ground. I mean, can't it... Can it take out the land, too? I mean, the dinosaurs seem to... Anyways, moving on. Um, I like removal spells. I like... Even if they're overcosted. Also, at 7 mana, we have Myrrh Battlesphere. Coming in at 33 cents, this 7 mana 4-7 Myrrh Construct enters the battlefield and creates four 1-1 one, one colorless myrrh artifact creature tokens. Let's do the math. We got seven mana. We got an 8-11 across five bodies in colorless. How did this get made? The power and toughness in this is crazy. Like, we've we've talked about a lot of different creatures that put bodies on the battlefield, and Myrrh Battlesphere does it the best, and you can slot it into any deck. And by the way, it gets better. When it attacks, you may tap X untapped Mur you control, and it gives Mur Battle Sphere plus X plus O until end of turn and deals X damage to the player planeswalker it's attacking. So it also turns those Murs into extra damage because it deals damage and pumps. So you're you're I don't know, it's like you're attacking for 12 with this seven drop in colorless? You can blink it, and then suddenly you get four more bodies. You can pump up your team with it. I mean, it's it's really good. This is another sort of big finisher effect, and at seven mana, it's doing it's doing a lot. It's pulling its weight. Uh, it's hard to compare it to a lot of other things. I mean, if you're comparing it to something with that many bodies, uh, think about Hornet. Think about Hornet Queen. Okay, Hornet Queen is also seven mana. You have to go trip green to get there, okay? Seven mana trip green. I know they got death touch and flying, so it's not exactly a good comparison, but seven mana for a two two versus a four seven. This four seven attacks way better. This uh, These one ones have a lot more defensive power to them. But we're talking about this big difference. We got 33 cents versus a dollar 83, okay? And there's a ton more cards out there that really... I mean, I think I already mentioned it right here. The power involved in Deep Forest Hermit can really be seen over here in Mer Battlesphere too. It just really pumps out a bunch of damage across a bunch of different bodies. And that's what we need is you spread your damage across bodies. Then if someone answers your Mer Battlesphere, they're not truly answering your entire board. It's amazing. Let's get into some other big creatures Artisan of Kozilek. This is an Eldrazi for 9 mana. It's a 10-9. Whenever you cast a spell, you may return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Annihilator 2. Okay, so this reanimator effect is a solid effect. Like, you'd pay 4 for that and be happy. So this would mean it's a sort of a 5 mana 10-9 Annihilator 2? Yeah, that price is good. And the real price of this card is 35 cents. Okay, Annihilator 2 is strong. This body is strong. Let's compare it to the other Eldrazi because that's what we want. We want this powerful Eldrazi effect. There's Artisan of Kozilek coming in here. Uh, and then we can compare it to Bane of Balaged. 
Uh, Bane of Balaget is cheaper, still has an Annihilator 2, doesn't bring anything back, and really doesn't have the toughness to survive. I don't know if that's great. Uh, let's move on to, by the way, I'm not going to talk about cards that don't have Annihilator because that's really what we're looking for is that that big body, you know what I mean? Well, Drawsy Conscription is solid because it really does give your things, give, make them huge and have Annihilator too. This was reprinted in Ultimate Masters, but is over $7. Blah. Okay. Uh, let's go up to the big ones. It That Betrays. I think it's like eight bucks. No, closing in on 10, it's 9.25 for It That Betrays, Annihilator 2. Uh, really, really strong effect. I love It That Betrays, but $9 is not, you know, 35 cents. It's just not. Okay, going on, we've got Kozilek right here. Kozilek is really strong. We got $30 versus 30 cents. Stupid difference. Okay. And then we got, what else we got over here? Let's go to the Ulamog. Ulamog is $24. I mean, here's the thing. The Annihilator matters. These are Annihilator 4. Annihilator 4, Annihilator 4. You know, that's a big difference. Indestructible on uh, Ulamog is also really good. Drawing four cards is way better than bringing a creature back. So, so yeah, like this, I would rather pay one more mana for Kozilek uh, or, you know, another mana for Ulamog or even 12 for it that betrays. I mean, I think that they are just better cards than Artisan of Kozilek, but by how much? By that margin where we're talking about 30 cents versus $30? It's crazy. Um, let's compare it to Crusher. Crusher's got to attack each turn. 8 mana, 8, 8, Annihilator 2. Okay, also budget at 19 cents. But come on, 11 more cents or, you know, 20 more cents to basically get a, and one more mana to get a whole nother creature back. One extra mana. A whole creature back from your graveyard. It's just great. Okay, we're done talking Eldrazi. This is very clearly a strong card for 35 cents. By the way, at nine mana, you're going to have something good in your graveyard. Let's talk about Bag of Holding. One mana artifact, whenever you discard a card, exile that card from your graveyard. Two and tap, draw a card, then discard a card. Four and tap, sacrifice Bag of Holding, return all cards exiled with Bag of Holding to their owner's hands. Okay, so this is weird, convoluted card draw. And it's got some good style to it. Bag holding is a D&D &D callback. And so it's really fun to have a reference to it here. So let's go through bag of holding slowly. Let's try to figure out how much mana I have to put in to draw however many cards. Three cards. Because I feel like three cards is a threshold. You know, what am I expecting to pay for three cards? I think I'd pay harmonize or concentrate mana. Four mana for three cards. In an artifact, let's hope I can get away with five mana for three cards. Okay, uh, one to deploy the Bag of Holding, okay? Two mana to loot, okay? I'm not up a card, but I've drawn and discarded a card, did a card, cool. Um, two more to loot, now I'm at five mana. I've basically have two cards underneath Bag of Holding and I've selected, I've found other ways of card selection. If I were to then crack this for four, then I just get the two cards I discarded back again. So I'm up two cards I didn't really want for nine mana. Is that is that really what's happening? Like that does that sounds horrible. Okay. So bag of holding, as intended, as it is just on the card, I think is awful. <laughs> it really is. So so how do we use this card? Why is it good? Okay. So looting is still a strong effect in many different colors. And so just the idea of looting for two mana every single time, I actually think that that's good enough in many situations. But where I really think Bag of Holding pulls ahead is when other effects have you discarding cards. When someone Wheel of Fortunes or Windfalls or has you discard or anything, there's so many different cards that have you discard. And then suddenly they're saved for you under Bag of Holding. And then you can cash it in and get all of those cards back. That's where you see a huge, huge advantage. And so I like Bag of Holding as sort of a defensive mechanism for 
other people's huge draw effects or other people's discard effects or maybe even in your own deck. You know, looting is going to be really solid in red decks and green decks, white decks and stuff like that. And so many situations you might just, I don't know, uh, need to discard that impulse draw like the, the thrill of possibility or cathartic reunion for red. And then suddenly you have a few cards under bag of holding, you know, maybe you're triggering, uh, um, in white, maybe you're triggering land tax. I've seen that happen a lot where you have land tax and you just need to loot some of those lands away. Well, that's actual good card advantage where you have an influx of lands into your hand and then you can sort of easily turn those into more important cards. That's an important effect in that color. So I can really see Bag of Holding uh, providing this card advantage to some of these colors that really, really need it. I'm I'm happy to give this a try, um, even though if you look at it on its own, like just as its own card, it's too slow. It really, it really is too slow. It's too clunky. You can't just you know be using it as it is. You have to be wanting to loot, and you have to be you have to bring something else to the table. Um, but it's an interesting effect. I really like it. Okay. Speaking of this uh, two mana crystal ball, not two mana, three mana crystal ball. It's an artifact, one and a tap, scry two. Um, scry two is, is great. Scrying is great. I mean, I'm wondering how much scry is worth a card in commander. I mean, whenever you don't need a land and you scry it to the bottom, that's a that's like card draw. It's so it's so good. And so Crystal Ball coming in at 27 cents is really really is uh, a strong effect. It's like kind of like a Sensei's Divining Top a little bit. Um except for Sensei's Divining Top uh Sensei's Divining Top is expensive and doesn't even give you the card bench $34. Get out of here. It doesn't even really let you shift things around because you're always going to be floating the same cards on top. And then sometimes you might put the card on top, but you're not actually getting deeper into your deck. With Crystal Ball, yeah, 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 you are. You can put them on your the bottom of your library. You can clear out cards on top and really get deeper. The reason why Divining Top is so much more expensive is because it combos with other things, okay? And uh, if you can shuffle, if you have shuffle effects, if you have fetch lands, if you have other ways to shuffle your deck, then Sensei's Divining Top gets real deep real fast for really cheap, just one mana. And you can keep doing it over and over again. If Crystal Ball didn't have this tap right here, then it would be insane. This would be a staple. Everyone would go crazy for it. But trust me, just scrying two every single turn is almost like a three mana artifact that has one tap draw card. Kind, 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 kind. It's a little bit, it's a little bit worse than that. But but trust me, in the late game, it's gonna be so good. This also combos with top deck things. I know that you're not playing temporal. Um, no, it's not temporal manipulation. Uh, I know you're not playing that extra turn effect because it's really expensive. But let's look at miracles. Uh, let's find out if any of them are. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> Banishing stroke. You're not really playing. You might be playing bonfire. Devastation Tide is really fun. I'm pretty sure that this is budget two. It's over a dollar now. Uh, but basically, this is a huge miracle effect that bounces everything back to your hand. You might be wanting to play Entreat the Angels. This is a dollar because it came out in Commander 2018. You know, put this on, scry it on top, miracle it when you need to, and suddenly you are you got this huge effect. Uh, Entreat the Dead, I'm not happy with it. I hate that it only hits your own graveyard, but it's it's definitely powerful if you can pull it off. But I think that what you're really excited about is Terminus. I mean, Temporal Mastery is fine, but it's expensive. Nine bucks. Terminus is cheap. Oh, I thought it was cheaper. A dollar seventeen, But it is pretty cheap for that effect. In Terminus, you can also float on top and really mess with the top of your library. Top of the library shenanigans is great. And so I think that Crystal Ball is super solid and you should be playing it, especially for 27 cents. Some good budget card selection there. Let's talk about the best card out of Throne of Eldraine for 24 cents. It's Heraldric Banner. It's an artifact for three mana. As Heraldric Banner enters the battlefield, choose a color. Creatures of the chosen color get plus one plus zero. 
Tap to add one mana of the chosen color to your mana pool. It's a mana rock for three. It's actually it's actually a solid one because you get to choose the colors. So it's not just a colorless one. I know it doesn't fix for every single one of your colors in multiplayer, but this is really solid in a, in a, a single color deck because it ramps you. And it's a anthem. We talked about anthems. I love them. It's on Judith. It's on uh, Goblin Orflame, which I mentioned a bunch of times. It's it's on a lot of different cards, and I really think it's worth two or three mana uh, to get that anthem. And so the fact that it's worth two or three mana to get an anthem, then how much are you paying for this mana rock? So this feels like a two for one and like incidental uh, incidental. Um, ramp and incidental damage all put together. So when you put them together in a deck that needs it, it's just so good. I need this in the... I need to add this to my green deck. Let me write this down. We did it. Moving on. Play Heraldric Banner. Um, We talked about these other artifacts because this one's white and this one's blue. We've got two more cards left. Oracle's Vault. Four mana artifact. Tap Exile the top card of your library until your next, until your end of your turn. You may play that card. Put a brick counter on Oracle's Vault. So, four mana, two tap, draw a card. <laughs> it's not exactly draw a card, but you can basically play the card. It's like you have access to another card. Okay, it can it can also be lands too. So you can just play the top card. That seems fine. So, uh, what's this brick counter thing? Exile the top card of your library until in a turn. You may play that card without paying its mana cost if you have three or more brick counters on it. Wait, what? So now, suddenly, I can just tap this and not only do I get to draw the card, I get it for free? This becomes this big free effect that I could just play the card? Like, when on... When, there's a lot of cards in Magic that you play things for free, but at 23 cents? I mean, I'm just curious here. I'm just curious. I'm going to look up without paying its mana cost. I shouldn't have done it is with its... Did I do... Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, without paying its mana cost. Um... We have expensive things. We have uh, uh, Allure of the Unknown lets your opponent do that. That's not great. Amanatu's Augury is eight mana and a very splashy effect, and I think it's over a dollar, just a little bit. Baral's Expertise lets you pay some play something for free, but it's smaller. Same thing with all those. Oh, Deluvian Primordial is great. These Primordials, by the way, well worth their price tag. Every single one of them. Sepulchral Primordial, Sylvan Primordial is banned. Okay, but all of them are great, and they used to be under a dollar. Um, some of them even used to be like 30 cents or something like that, but just buy them. Like they, They're well worth it for $1.50. Um, but I'm looking at these cards, and like, here we go. Like, Knowledge Exploitation is $3, you know? I mean, all of them are 7 mana. Like, they're expensive, you know? To live in Primordial, seven mana. I know that these give you like huge advantages, but Mind's Dilation is seven mana and five dollars. Mind's Desire is random. <laughs> 70 cents though, that's pretty That's pretty good uh, for that one. Memory Plunder, I love Memory Plunder, over a dollar. Uh, but again, this is, this is four mana and you can only hit instants and sorceries uh, out of your opponent's graveyard, so pretty limited. You're not having access to your own to your own deck. Mizix's Mastery is expensive, over ten dollars. Oh, nice job, Mystery Booster, getting some reprints here. Um, but it's uh, pretty crazy, only hitting instants and sorceries. I mean, it's Oracle's Vault, man. Like it's it's good. It's letting you cast stuff for free. Free casting. It colorless. It can go in any deck. It gives you card advantage, and it's recur- you can repeat it over and over again. I know when you to get there, it's 10 mana and 3 turns. But the thing is that on the way, it's not bad. It's really not that bad to pay, pay 6 mana uh, to start this process off. You know, um, 6 mana to draw a card is, is, is not good. You know, 
Neither is eight mana for two cards or 10 mana for three cards. But then after that whole process, you get a broken engine. It's it's so good. And I can't see you getting that effect for 23 cents. And I can't see you getting that effect in colorless. Man, it's great. Okay, moving on to the last card. This one was controversial. Um, a lot of people disagreed with my assessment in my video because I spent a little bit more time on Aeon Engine than other cards. Let's read it first. Five mana for an artifact. Aeon Engine enters the battlefield tapped. You can tap and exile Aeon Engine to reverse the game's turn's order. For example, if play had proceeded clockwise around the table, it now goes counterclockwise. Um, 25 cents out of Commander 2019. Why is this good? So, I'd like to compare Aeon Engine to Time Warp. Time Warp is a 5-mana sorcery that says target player takes an extra turn after this one. Uh, extra turn effects are undoubtedly powerful, and they're expensive. They carry a price tag close to it. Um, it was reprinted in Explorers of Exelon, so a recent reprint, and it's still at $12. Uh, Aeon Engine is not an extra turn effect. You don't just get to take an extra turn. It's very powerful to uninterrupted be able to just be like, okay, I'll take an extra turn, extra combat, extra everything. Just keep your turn rolling so that no one else can jump in the middle of it. It's it's honestly, it's great. Uh, and Aeon Engine can't even approximate that because it enters the battlefield tapped. So you can't just play it and then instantly activate it. So no, it's not an extra turn effect. And so even though I think that it approximates that as you sort of move to someone else's turn and then reverse the order and it comes back to your turn, the, the, the slowness of it entering the battlefield tapped means that everyone can prepare for it. It can get blown up. It's uh, problematic in that area. Okay, so what can it do? Well, changing the turn order is a much stronger effect than I think you believe. Uh, Josh Lee Kwai uh, and I, when I was uh, subbing for Jimmy on the command zone, we did a lot of stuff with statistics. In fact, there was a two-part episode. We talked about all sorts of statistics. Uh, Josh hired a statistician. We all geeked out about it. There was a whole team of people evaluating it. And one of the statistics was turn order really matters. The people that go first have a big advantage and the person that goes last really is at a disadvantage. And we thought, well, why? Okay, um, we know that it has a small advantage uh, in one v one, and maybe the card, you know, disparity between them could make up the difference of that. But why is it such a big effect in Commander? Well, and the thing that Josh and I came up with, and a lot of people agree with, is that every single turn that goes by in Commander, uh, basically, that effect builds. Because someone having three mana instead of two mana, they can deploy their cards first and it's an advantage. But honestly, in Commander, someone having 10 or 12 mana before everyone else really lets you deploy several cards at once and make these big moves that essentially end games. And so it becomes uh, uh, exacerbated as the turn goes on further and further and further and as you get these big influxes of mana before everyone else does. So how do we answer that? Well, you can jump the turn order. I actually think that Vidal Canori and Leyline of Anticipation sort of let players jump in the turn order, even though they take a tempo hit uh, by keeping their mana up during their turn and kind of waiting for them to go around and for playing a do-nothing four drop, they really gain that back in sort of jumping the turn order later on where they can always react rather than um, rather than be forced to answer the, the front runner or the front player. Now, Aeon Engine is not as powerful as that, but what it can do is sort of rob that turn order back again that sort of puts you in the driver's seat that immediately gives you that influx of mana that the other players might might have that you might need so think about it this way um an extra turn effect definitely pushes you ahead of everyone else you've got an extra turn but i think that aeon engine can really put you ahead of some of the other players uh, at the table because reversing the turn order can mean many other turns i mean let's just kind of lay it out here uh, in a four-player game 
Okay. Uh, let's say that it's uh, your turn and uh, you finally sort of caught up with the rest of the table. Okay. You let the next player go and uh, they're, they're doing fine, you know, and then you activate an engine and suddenly it's your turn again. Uh, you've kind of robbed two more players, you know, the player further to the left, instead of going next, he's got to wait for you and then wait for another player. He has to wait two more turns in order to get their turn. Um, that's a lot. That's like a time stretch for them. So that's not good. And then uh, the other player, again, has to wait in a whole extra turn. So it's like a time warp for one player and a time stretch for the other player before they finally get their turn. So some players definitely have to wait a long time in between turns when you activate an Aeon engine. You sort of double the distance uh, before some of the players get their turns. And that is a big, that's a big effect, especially if this can be really used politically to sort of hit the other opponent on multiple fronts. You know, you can activate this right before not just right after your turn, but right before the most powerful player. So when it's right about to be the most powerful player's turn, you're like, no, 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 reverse that. And suddenly each one of you gets another opportunity to team up against that powerful player. This is an equalizer. This is a way to get back in the game. This is a way to punish powerful decks, to make them wait. You know, they think it's their turn and then suddenly they have to wait like two or three more turns before they get theirs. That's amazing. I mean, I think that Aeon Engine is sneaky powerful. It's obvious that an extra turn is powerful. Aeon Engine approximates an extra turn, okay? But I have a feeling that it does a lot more. And I'm a little bit disappointed it's this slow. And it's not great that it exiles itself, and enters the battlefield tapped, whatever. Five mana do nothing is rough. But here's the thing, this effect is at 25 cents. I mean, come on, I am I think that you should try it out. Uh, when I was researching for this video, I threw it in a couple decks. I only had a chance to activate it once uh, and um, it was good. It was very good. I think that this thing clearly needs more testing. It might be too narrow for a lot of decks. It might not work in all the same situations, but... Um, I honestly think that you're going to see really strong effects with this. You're going to feel it. And honestly, some of your opponents are going to hate it, which means that it's going to be good. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching this video. It's been long. It's been a long time talking about this stuff, but this has inspired me to build a few more budget decks. Um, I've got a few more in the works. Actually, I was building some budget decks and that had me frustrated because I couldn't reach the price points that I used to. So I went out searching for budget cards and I came up with so many good ones. I wanted to share them with you. So coming up in the future, we have some more budget decks and really I'm excited for everything that's coming up. Thank you for supporting me. Cool Stuff Inc. supports the Jumbo Commander YouTube channel. If you go to their website, you'll get 5% off your order if you use the coupon code JUMBO5. Cool Stuff Inc. has lots of different cards. You can get them super cheap. And so I hope that uh, you use them. And I really love them because they support me. Uh, because uh, two hour long videos uh, aren't exactly what YouTube algorithm likes to see. But do you know what? I just like being here and chatting with you. Uh, the other people that really support me is Patreon. Uh, they let me do things like this as well. So, so thank you to my patrons. Thank you to Cool Stuff Inc. And thank you for watching this. You know, lots of people have been sitting here listening to me talk, 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 talk for a really long time. And you're giving me great feedback in the comments. Um, and so this really makes me feel good. Uh, thank you. And hopefully you can take these budget cards, use them in your decks, build with them, start a commander collection. And so you can go to your binders and be like, oh, like with confidence, like I can build this new commander I pulled at draft, or I can build this card that I traded from with this, this stuff I have. Bam, 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 bam. It'll be great. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone again. And I'll see y'all real soon. Bye-bye.